I have a question for you. I hope you know the answer to this question because I'm not sure that I do. Uh, you'll get to hear my reflections this morning, but you'll have to share yours with me after the sermon. Here's the question. How much is enough? That's not a simple question. First of all, you're probably wondering enough of what? How much is enough money, enough time, enough generosity, enough righteousness. How you answer those questions is going to have a good deal to do with the choices you make in your life. And if you've never considered the question, how much is enough, and you're living your life without reference to that, you've probably made some bad choices along the way. Money and time might seem like the easiest of those two to figure out because those are things that can be measured and counted. Should, time should be the simplest because we all have the same amount of it and nobody can get any more. But I know couples and families who fight about time. There's a lot of conventional wisdom out there about money and how much we need, but not a lot of agreement on a certain number. In fact, if you were to sit down with a financial advisor and say, how much money do I need? They are likely to ask you, how much money do you think you need? There are a bunch of cartoons out there around the idea that money can't buy happiness. Here is just one of those cartoons. Most of us have probably felt like this guy who says, all I want is a chance to prove that money can't make me happy. <laughs> when so much of our time is spent working for money or managing what we have worked for already, it's pretty easy to assume that if we just had more money, life would be easier and we'd be happier. Turns out that this is true to a point, and then it isn't. There have been several studies that have duplicated these results uh, in this country and in other countries. This is a graph of income versus happiness. And for the uh, purposes of this study, happiness is defined as uh, feeling happy. The red line in the middle is um, having some, uh, not feeling happy, and the bottom line is feeling some stress or anxiety. You'll notice that those are all lower when income is below the level that we have to provide what we need or to give us some kind of equity with our neighbors. But then as income increases, that happiness does not go up. In fact, in some of these studies, at the highest level of income, the levels of happiness start to drop off. So how do we get to that sweet spot where we have enough? I said at the beginning, I don't think there's a simple answer to this question, but I believe our text from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians has some wisdom to offer. Paul says, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Sounds to me like Paul is saying that we have enough when we have enough to share with others. Now, to be perfectly frank here, this is a fundraising letter or a fundraising part of the letter Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. He's raising funds for the church in Jerusalem. And in chapter 8, 
Paul reminds the church at Corinth that he just came from Macedonia, a church where the people are in extreme poverty. And despite their poverty and persecution, they have given with a wealth of generosity. Generosity isn't calculated by a number. It's calculated by our willingness to share what we have with others. The church in Macedonia, despite its poverty, had enough to share. The wealthier church in Corinth, not so much. This may not sound like it relates to the mission and possibilities that I've been talking about through the month of June and we've been hearing about from our ministry teams, but I think generosity and abundance have to be part of that conversation. Without an attitude of generosity and abundance, we limit the possibilities of what we can do and we block the mission that God may be trying to accomplish through us. Paul tells the church in Corinth, you will be enriched in every way for your generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. It is generosity which produces the harvest of righteousness. We know when we have enough because we stop worrying about how to hang on to it and start wondering about how we can share it with other people. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table this morning, I'd like us to consider generosity. Not ours, but God's. Paul uses the imagery of grain and begins by pointing out that it's only if we plant abundantly that we will reap abundant gifts. In verse 10, Paul reminds us that the seed and the grain and the harvest and the bread are all gifts from God. There will be enough bread and juice on the table for us today. Probably not so much that we won't have to have lunch after we leave here, uh, but there's always the fellowship time following this where you'll get fed. But this bread and cup point to something much greater than themselves. This bread and cup are symbols of a generosity so great that I can hardly comprehend it. They're reminders of Jesus Christ, a life that was lived for God's purpose and a life which was given for our salvation. The Church of the Brethren does not teach that this bread and juice literally become the body of Christ. But we remember Christ's covenant to bring us into his kingdom through these tangible things, these small things, which point to an eternal reality. Anyone who is in fellowship with God and their neighbor is invited to come to the Lord's table today. And I hope the implications of that are not lost on us. I want to note just a few of them. The only person who can determine whether I am in right relationship with God and with my neighbors is me. It's what the Church of the Brethren means by saying we are a priesthood of believers. There is no pastor or priest or bishop who is going to hear your confession and absolve you or do the work for you of getting right with God and your neighbor. If you are mature enough to be a follower of Christ, then it is your responsibility to tend to those things before you come to the Lord's table. That is one of the commitments that we make as disciples and which we recommit to every time we, we partake in this bread and this cup. 
The body of Christ is represented by the bread of communion, but the body of Christ is also the people who come to the table. We are Christ's hands and feet. We are the one whom God has chosen to do God's work in the world. None of us have earned an invitation to this table. It's a gift which is offered to each one of us. It was offered to every believer who came before us. It, was off, it will be offered to everyone who comes after us. It was offered to us while we were still sinners. And it is offered with the knowledge that we continue to sin and fall short of God's will for us. However imperfectly we individually or corporately embody the body of Christ, we are still invited to come, not because we're worthy, but because we are God's children. There is enough. There is enough for us. There is enough for our neighbors. There is enough to share with the world in Christ's name.